come to this uh, press briefing by the representative office of the National Council of Resistance of Iran in the United Kingdom. Uh, my name is uh, Hussein Abedini and uh, from the Foreign Affairs Committee of the NCRI, and I'm the deputy director of the NCRI office in London. In our briefing today, uh, unique uh, on its own right, a number of survivors of the 1988 massacre many of whom had uh, first-hand uh, experience with Raisi, will share their uh, experience and observations. Before we hear their testimonies, I want to state that a group of survivors of the 1988 massacre, all affiliated uh, to the People's Mujahideen of Iran, or MEK, uh, including those who are taking part in today's uh, press briefing, they will launch a multifaceted international campaign against Raisi on various aspects and venues. And as one might uh, imagine, uh, calls for the independent United Nations mission on 1988 massacre will aim Raisi as one of the main perpetrators in those mass killings. <clears throat> so the first thing he would probably face when he comes uh, to the office is calls in different countries to bring him before international tribunals and uh, justice. Now, before I introduce our witnesses today, uh, please allow me to say a few words about the upcoming presidential election, which the people of Iran actually call it a selection. As you know, Iran is on the brink of a uh, seminal uh, transformation in this year's presidential election. The regime's supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, took a major step to push through his preferred candidate uh, for the presidency, Ibrahim Raisi, current head of the regime's judiciary. Uh, through his own appointed guardian council, which is a totally clergy-dominated council, Khamenei disqualified all those who could be Raisi's rivals even characters such as uh, Ali Larijani, who for 12 years was the speaker of the regime's uh, parliament majlis and Khamenei's current uh, personal advisor, as well as his uh, special representative on a special foreign missions, including in relations with China, could no longer be tolerated by the regime. Therefore, Khamenei has decidedly chosen to raise Raisi to the presidency and sacrifice those closest to him. So this masquerade is now a one-man show. But who is Ibrahim Raisi? Ibrahim Raisi, current judiciary chief, is a subservient disciple to Ruhollah Khomeini. The Iranian people know Raisi as the henchman of the 1988 massacre. He was a key perpetrator of the murder of over 30,000 political prisoners, the overwhelming majority of whom were the supporters and members and activists of the People's Mujahideen of Iran. He has no academic or religious credentials, even, even within the, the, this murderous uh, theocracy. In short, Raisi earned his credentials in the regime as a stone-hearted killer who rose the ranks of ignorant thugs with a proven 40-year track record for execution and repression. In the summer and autumn of 1988, he was a member of the death commission in Evin and Guhardash prisons. In the death commission, Raisi actually played the prosecutor's role. He served as Khomeini's fixer and received special missions from him to carry out purges in other provinces, including Loristan, Kermanshah, and Semnan. Khomeini had given Raisi full authority and they were not obliged to obey any administrative or governmental restrictions uh, or orders. Uh, you may know that last September, uh, seven United Nations special rapporteurs uh, wrote to the Mullah's regime on the 1988 prison massacres. 
that if the Iranian regime does not uh, prosecute those who are responsible uh, for these killings and also the harassment of the families of the victims of executions, uh, the, the regime, uh, if it didn't stop that, they would call for an independent investigation for this crime against humanity. A serious question now is why Khomeini, uh, Khomeini was obliged uh, to opt for such a negative figure as the regime's next president. We also know that 150 uh, very prominent uh, <clears throat> uh, jurists, as well as uh, 40 uh, former United Nations uh, rapporteurs, they wrote uh, a letter to uh, Michel Bachelet, the, the uh, uh, OHCHR uh, president, and they ask for the UN High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights to immediately act and form an in independent investigative committee to bring the perpetrators of those crimes to justice. So the answer why Khamenei was forced to bring uh, Raisi and he became his main uh, candidate should be found in the domestic situation in Iran. Actually, this year's election is radically different with those in the years past. It comes after three major nationwide uprisings in January 2018, November 2019, and January 2020. So today, more than ever, the regime continues to confront an explosive society which is on the verge of uprising. Despite a global pandemic, protests are held daily by virtually every social sector. Regime officials and media warn of the pending bigger uprising publicly, which is even uh, much more stronger than the previous uprisings and could be much more radical uh, compared with the, with the previous ones. To make matters worse, the economy is completely bankrupt and the regime is isolated regionally and internationally. In fighting is escalating uh, dramatically uh, within the regime. And the organized opposition continues to flourish in the form of resistance units across the country. Nationwide calls for the boycott of the sham elections have also gained momentum. Officials and state media are sounding the, the alarm. Every single day, they are warning about the growing appeal of the main opposition, Mujahideen Khal, MEK, especially among the youth and amongst the women of Iran. With the regime at its weakest point in history, Khamenei felt he had no other choice but to purge all its rival factions to main, maintain a stability of the ruling clique. But this has major consequences and repercussions for the regime. The big question is whether uh, even with such drastic measures, the mullahs would be able to manage the growing social dissent. Message to the international community is clear. Khamenei had no choice but to end the reformist hardliner show, which uh, they used it for many, many years to deceive the international community. And uh, uh, it, this will embarrass those in the West who for decades have advocated appeasement and a so-called soft line approach vis-a-vis -vis the regime, which has uh, taken different names under uh, different, in different circumstances, uh, in different junctures. Now the world has seen that the Iranian, uh, the, has seen the Iranian regime for what it is. Raisi as president signals more repression at home, more ter terrorism and belligerence in the region and more intransigence uh, towards the West and the international community. Now with these uh, uh, words, oh, please allow me to uh, introduce our uh, witnesses. Our first witness is Ms. Farida Gudarzi. If I ask Ms. Gudarzi to please make her remarks. Thank you. Hamiya Hamihanam Dar Iran, 
I, I, uh, I greet my uh, compatriots in Iran and all over the world. My name is Faride Gudarzi. I'm one of the sympathizers of the People's Mujahideen Organization of Iran, the MEK. I'm one of the few remaining uh, witnesses to the events of uh, 1988 and the massacres that took place. In uh, 1981, in the summer, I was arrested, and for about six years, I spent uh, in uh, Hamedan prisons and Nahavan prison. I was in prison in those uh, jails. I want to relate to you some of the uh, crimes that I witnessed from uh, this uh, person, Ibrahim Raisi, during uh, my imprisonment in Hamadan. Many of them, many people know him as a mass murderer of 1988, but I want to go a little bit further back and uh, relate to you what Raisi did in Hamadan prison. When I was arrested uh, in 1983, uh, they took me to the interrogation room, the torture room. It was about three by four meters. There was a, a bed uh, in the middle of it and there was uh, electric cables all over the room and on the floor there was blood. I was, not, uh, I was not in a good physical condition, but they put me on the bed and they started whipping me with the electrical cables. About seven, eight people were on top of the table. And uh, one, of, one, uh, one of them was a young 22, 23 year old person who I later learned from others that was Ibrahim Raisi, who was at that time the prosecutor of Hamadan, the city that I was imprisoned in. After a while, my child was born while I was imprisoned. And uh, one of the methods that uh, uh, the regime uses in its prisons to torture the prisoners is uh, to, uh, to uh, to abuse the children of these prisoners which are with them in the prison. I would like to tell you about one case which, came, uh, which uh, happened for my own child. But first I have to say that Raisi, as everyone knows, at uh, 21 years old, when he was, uh, didn't have any literacy academically or religiously, was the prosecutor of uh, the province of Hamadan and, and Karaj at the same time. And all the prisoners in Hamadan and in Nahavan and in Malayer and in Tui Sirkan, which were in the, under his authority during the early 1980s, uh, had been imprisoned uh, in those prisons, were tortured and uh, were executed with the direct involvement of Ibrahim Raisi as the prosecutor of Habanan province. I remember uh, during September, uh, about 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, I was in a solitary confinement and uh, suddenly the jail door was kicked open and seven, eight uh, guards opened the, uh, came into the room the room was a small room, about one meter by one and a half meters. And my child was sleeping. And it was about, he was, the child was 38 days old. And at that time, the one of the persons was Raisi, Ibrahim Raisi. They came in, they, they uh, threw everything on the ground. And while my 38 day old child was sleeping, one of them lifted him up and uh, and about uh, uh, 60 centimeters uh, in the air, he was holding him and let him go. And uh, the child fell to the ground and uh, woke up uh, in, in, in terror. And uh, they were trying, they took off all my child's clothes, looking for documents in the clothes. And then they took me to the court, uh, to the court in the prison uh, with my child, and there were seven, eight interrogators there as well, and they were abusing me and intimidating me and uh, abusing my child. And while my child was crying, uh, one of the guards took him and was uh, beating him hard to, to, 
to 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 uh, silence him. And Raisi was witnessing all of this and was uh, encouraging it. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Farida Gudarzi, for those very uh, shocking experience uh, that you uh, you just explained to us. Uh, we all had that uh, Ms. Farida Gudarzi who was. Mamuna in- Yes, please. I, I thank you. Uh, there's not enough time, of course, but I have a lot of uh, stories to tell about my imprisonment and uh, Raisi, but there's not enough time. Thank you. Uh, we heard, you know, that uh, those shocking remarks by Ms. Farida Gudarzi, who lost the uh, brother and sister, as well as, you know, what happened to her uh, newborn baby. Our next... Uh, uh, witness is Mr. Muhammad Zan. Mr. Zan was in Evin, Ezel Hesar, and Gohardash prison for 11 years from 1960 to 1971, and, and, uh, and was in Gohardash uh, prison at the time of the 1988 massacre, in which, in which he lost his brother Reza, who was ser- serving at the time, uh, his prison terms at the same time. So if I'm ask uh, Mr. Zan to please make your remark. در سال 67 که البته بخشی از اون در زندان گوهردش بود و رئیسی هم اونجا بود اشاره کنم. I like to refer to the 1988 massacres in which Raisi was present. I'd like to say, uh, first of all, hello. I would like to speak about uh, the massacre of uh, political prisoners in uh, Gohardash prison, where I was at that time, and uh, Raisi was there as well. In Gohardash prison on Saturday, uh, 29th of August, uh, 1988, the massacre started. Two days before that, on Thursday night, uh, I and a few other prisoners were summoned. We were asked what was our charge. We said we are supporters of the Mujahideen, the MEK. The guards brutally beat us so that uh, my ribs as well as my thumb uh, was broken. We were then sent back to the ward and told us that they would come back for us on Saturday. On Saturday, they called the same names, but they took my brother Reza's hand by mistake instead of me and he was in prison with me at that time, and he was sitting next to me at that time. And this is uh, the picture of my brother, Reza Zand, who was taken uh, instead of me. A few days later, uh, they took me out of the main ward and put me into another cell. On uh, August 6, 1988, we were taken to the death squad, to the death commission. Uh, at that death commission was Ibrahim Raisi and uh, Hussein Ali Nayari and Mustafa Pur Muhammadi and Murtaza Ishraqi, who were members of the death commission. Of course, I, at that time, I did not uh, know Raisi, Ibrahim Raisi, but later I found out this was the same person uh, who was the henchman of the 1988 massacre. Uh, when I saw his picture, I realized this. The death commission informed me that they had executed my brother. Outside in the corridor of death, I saw a prisoner called Nasser Mansouri, who was on a stretcher. Uh, In order to keep information about the operational structure inside the prison, Nasser Mansouri, uh, because he was under torture, had thrown himself uh, from the second floor and this had caused his spinal cord injury so that he couldn't move. And he had not died, but he couldn't move. Raisi and the rest of the criminals had no mercy on him. They issued his death sentence. And uh, Mahmoud Zaki was another person who went in front of the same death commission. And uh, that Raisi uh, was a member of that death commission. I asked Mohammed when he came outside after the hearing, what happened? He replied, I told him that I am from the MEK. I was a sympathizer. And uh, they told me that your sentence is death. And they took him to the gallows. They had all sentences from the courts uh, uh, of this very regime. But in other words, they were serving their sentences, but they had 
crossed the red line by saying that they were supporters of the MEK still. And so Raisi and the other criminal members of this death commission had only one objective, and that was to kill more and more of the MEK sympathizers. And I appeared before the death commission myself three times, and Raisi was there as well. <clears throat> Let me tell you about Behzad Ramzi Ismaili. He was an international badminton referee. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He had been arrested before June 20th, 1981. During the period that prisoners were transferred to various prisons for the massacre in preparation for it, Behzad was also transferred to Evin, uh, from Evin to Gohadash prison. He was executed during the 1988 massacre. Behzad's father, father died of a heart attack after hearing the news of Behzad's execution. Parviz Sharifi was also one of our family friends. He was executed in Evin. Parviz's parents uh, suffered from severe depression that, uh, that, uh, as a, in a state of mourning all the time for their, for their son. They, they took my father to Evin uh, to ask uh, and asked him to bring Reza's ID card. Uh, so my own father, after my brother was executed, was summoned to Evin prison. And uh, they had told him on the telephone to bring Reza's ID card. My father went to Evin. He was then uh, presented the, uh, the ID and then um, they wanted to take uh, the, the ID to annul it. But he said that I have this ID, but I will not give it to you. And they said, it's not important. Uh, but they said, if you don't give the uh, ID card, we will not tell you where he is buried. And, they, and, and he said, uh, he's in my heart. And uh, so they, they blindfold him. They do three times uh, execution, um, acting out as they feel they were going to execute my father. And they tell him, they give him a bag, a few pieces of clothing and a shredded watch. And then they tell him, he, you are not allowed to mourn for your son. You're not allowed to hold a ceremony or a memorial. And uh, so at about uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, the, uh, the watch on uh, Reza's watch had stopped. And so my father knew that that was about the time that he had broken his watch to prevent it to be taken by the guards. My father, uh, did not uh, succumb to the guards. My father always wanted revenge for my son, for his son's execution. And uh, he hoped that this regime would be overthrown and the people would be free and this would be his revenge. Thank you so much for listening to me. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zan. Uh, now, after uh, the testimony by Mr. Zand, I would uh, propose that we see a short uh, video clip uh, on Raisi. This is an interview that uh, this butcher uh, made after the nationwide uprising, which followed the regime's rigged elections in 2009. This clearly proves uh, helpful to better understand the state of mind of this individual who considers anyone who opposes the regime as a muhareb or somebody who is at war with God. So please, let's see the video clip together. Muhareb ke az madde har de dar waqe. Muhareb unwan fiqhis be kisi miguyan ke un kas در مقابل در مقابل خدا و رسول خدا و حکم خدا و رسول خدا بیستد و در واقع جنگ با خدا و رسول خدا داشته باشه We have both in law and in jurisprudence that weapons are not just swords They are not just firearms No they can also include cold weapons that is, sometimes it is a stick, sometimes it is a knife, in the language of jurists, sometimes it is wood, sometimes it is stone. That is, with tools such as those you saw on the day of Ashura. 
Some people attack people with stones, sticks, clubs, swords, and so on. So Moharabe is a charge against someone who deprives the public of security and frightens the people. What happened on the day of Ashura can be examples of Moharabe and have the title of Moharabe. However, Moharabe is sometimes an organization. An organization becomes a warring organization like the organization of hypocrites. MEK. Within the MEK, anyone who helps the organization in any way under any circumstances, as it is an organized process, his act is considered Moharabe. Well, I think this short video clip uh, speaks for itself. Uh, we will now carry on with a few more testimonies. I would like now to ask uh, Mr. Reza Shemirani, who is a former political prisoner residing in Switzerland. Uh, Reza has spent uh, more than 10 years in the regime's prisons and was in Tehran's notorious Evin prison during the 19. 88 massacre. So, Mr. Shemirani, please go ahead. Thank <laughs> دادگاه ده سال زندان محکوم شدم و 1991 از زندان آزاد شدم در واقع من یک از شاهدین قتل عام هستم که 1367 در زندان اوین بودم مختصری رو براتون توضیح میدم توی زندان اوین 4 ژوئیه 1378 یکی از من در سلول انفرادی بودم که همبندی من امیر عبدالایی رو به حیط مرگ بردن سهرگاه پنجم جویه این رو ورگردوندن و حکم اعدام به شهر کرده بودن بردی اون روز ششم جویه خود من رو به حیط مرگ بردن که اون روز به من به خاطر تعداد زیادی از خواهرها و برادرایی که اونجا بودن زندانی که اونجا بودن به من نوبت نرسید و فردای اون روز دو جمعه بود ساعت هفتم ژوئیه 1988 من رو مجددا دو بعدر رو صدا کردم و به نزد هیئت مرگ در ساختمان داستانی زندان ایدم بردم نزدیکای ساعت دو بعدر رو بود که به من نوبت رسید من رو وارد اتاقی که از هیئت مرگ حضور داشتم بردم با چشمم بردم دو چشمم دو که برداشتم دیدم که دو تا ملا و دو تا دو نفر با لباس شخصی اونجا نشستم When I entered the court uh, of the death commission I saw that a mullah Nayari was there as a sharia judge he was sitting on the right uh, on the right side of him was uh, another mullah Ishraqi And on his left side was uh, uh, was uh, Mullah Pur Muhammadi, and next to him, uh, with a white shirt and a postar uniform and an IRGC uniform, was Ibrahim Raisi, who is now the chief of the judiciary and a presidential candidate in the regime's uh, sham elections. Um, considering that uh, my uh, uh, prison mate had been condemned uh, just uh, a while back, uh, they took they called this uh, the uh, a commission for pardoning uh, from the imam, imam meaning Khomeini, but we know it as a death commission. They asked me, what is my charge? Uh, I said uh, the organization, because I knew if I said uh, Mujahideen, they would immediately give me my uh, sentence, death sentence. I said, I am a supporter of the organization. Now at this point, Raisi uh, entered the discussion. He knew my case because one year before the 1988 massacre, I was uh, interrogated and tortured for uh, setting up a, the organization inside the prison. And Raisi, Ibrahim Raisi knew this. And he told Nayari, who was the Sharia judge, 
uh, at that commission. We asked him, where did he come? He said, uh, and I said, I came from Evin, of course, I'm in Evin. He said, no, which ward did you come from? And uh, uh, tell, uh, and uh, he said, ask uh, him, ask the defendant what uh, he was doing in that ward. And Nairi was in a rush to give us the death sentences and there was a lot outside the door uh, waiting to, to be sentenced, didn't have enough time. And so Raisi said to him, uh, allow me to take him outside and I will get the chart, the organizational chart of the MEK inside the prison from him. And Raisi took me out of uh, the death commission room and he said, uh, write down the organizational chart right now of the MEK inside the prison. I stood there for a few moments and I saw a guard coming there and a guard, uh, he made an announcement, this guard. He said, anyone who has been at the death commission, come with us. Anyone who hasn't been, sit down. And there, were, there was a commotion in the room at that time. And uh, they were saying that those who, uh, some of them have to go to Gohardash prison. And so I used this uh, uh, situation and I stood up and uh, so that I would not be interrogated further by Ibrahim Raisi. And uh, I, I was able to slip into that group, which was able to return to the ward. And um, later on, uh, on the 12th of August of 1988, about uh, noon time, uh, they took me uh, uh, about 10, 15 others again uh, to the death commission. While we were standing there, Around noon, I saw Nayari and Ibrahim Raisi uh, uh, coming out of the death commission to go to Gohardash prison. Because uh, until noon, they would uh, do the executions in Evin, and afternoon, they would do them in Gohardash. And so at that time, uh, I was not, I was not, I didn't go to the death commission because they went to Gohardash. And then it was the 28th of 1988 that it was about 2 p.m. in the afternoon and we were about 10 people. And they took us to the death commission again for the third time I was going. And uh, again, I saw Ibrahim Raisi and Mojtaba Halwai there. And Mojtaba Halwai took me outside of the queue and said, you are still alive. Uh, and Raisi said, take them to uh, ward 2000, 209. And, uh, and all of those in 209 were sentenced to death already because uh, they were uh, supporters of the MEK. And because of the many protests that had taken place against these executions and uh, Montazeri had intervened, uh, they didn't execute us and they returned us that. So in all these uh, days and weeks, I saw Raisi as an active member of the Death Commission, even more active than Nayari, who was the Sharia judge. And Nayari would tire uh, and couldn't uh, continue the process. And uh, 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 Raisi was careful that all those that needed to be taken care of would be executed. And so I ask you as uh, reporters to uh, please take into consideration our uh, witness statements, our testimonies, tell it to the world, let the world know what the massacres of 1988 were and why in Evin prison and in Gohardash prison, uh, more than 5,000 in these two prisons alone were executed over two month period. And, and uh, uh, people who, as my friend said, were already serving their sentences on previous convictions and had no connection to the outside of the prison. Why were they tried again? And why were they executed? Thank you very much for listening to me. I wish you all success. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shemirani for your uh, remarks. Uh, now our next uh, 
witness, eyewitness is Mr. Hussein Farsi. Mr. Farsi is a former political prisoners, a prisoner who has spent uh, 12 years in various prisons, including Guhardash prison in Karaj uh, during the 1988 massacre and witnessed many crimes committed by the clerical regime in prison. So Mr. Farsi, please go ahead. Uh, with greetings to you and uh, all the friends who are listening and are seeing me. And um, I would like to say, well, uh, my colleagues have all spoken about their experiences and what the death commission was and that Raisi was in this death commission. Uh, this crime of massacre has been uh, talked about and in and that uh, Raisi during the massacres was uh, the deputy to the prosecutor, but in the death commission, he was uh, the executioner. And uh, and for example, my brother, Hosseini Farsi, received his sentence uh, from this Ibrahim Raisi and who signed his death sentence. The crimes that uh, Raisi committed during the massacres uh, can see can be discerned uh, from the number of uh, directives that Khomeini gave to Raisi and Nayari personally directly there in this period. I would like to point out some uh, things uh, about uh, from other witnesses who are not here to testify, and I witnessed what was going on with them. Raisi because other colleagues will testify about the commission itself. Raisi in 1988 massacres was much more active than his uh, boss, which was uh, Ishraqi. And he was, uh, he, he, he became the favorite of Khomeini himself. Uh, after the 1988 massacre, Khomeini gave three edicts, three fatwa and directives to Raisi and Nayari. First, uh, he told them to uh, uh, take care of all the unsettled cases in Jahrum and Semnan. And then in Sirjan and Durud cities, and also all the cases that have not been settled in the Supreme uh, Judicial Council. So uh, these have been, these uh, directives have been issued by Khomeini in January of uh, 1989, actually. And uh, because in uh, August of 1988, uh, there was uh, uh, um, uh, the operation by the NLA in Islamabad, uh, Western Islamabad, which is in the west of Iran. And there were a lot of people who were arrested for sympathizing with the Mujahideen during, with the MEK during that operation. Of course, many of them were executed in those first days, but many of the, many others, innocent people, many of them were imprisoned in Islamabad in the west of Iran who were uh, connected or their cases were associated with that operation, so to speak. And uh, Raisi was sent to Islamabad to take care of these cases and to execute all those remaining in the prisons. So, um, uh, so Raisi uh, in a special court, uh, that was uh, uh, established by Naisi and Nayari secretly met in, in the joint committee and, um, and uh, issued sentences for uh, sympathizers of the MEK and secretly executed them. And they never declared these uh, executions and never took them responsibility for them. And, uh, and uh, the, they were buried in uh, secret graves. And uh, even after 30 years, uh, nothing has been clarified about their fate. 
1988 and 1989, uh, these names that I'm reading, Um, were um, disappeared, executed, and uh, and many others were secretly executed by these two people in the joint uh, committee, and their fate is unclear, and their parents do not know what happened to them. Their families do not know. And Hushang, uh, Abbas Nawai and Mehdad Kamali and others and many others were by, uh, tried by this special court secretly in the joint committee and secretly executed and uh, secretly buried. Another thing that I wanted to point out about uh, the criminal record of Raisi, uh, about 1994 in Mashhad, there was an uprising and many people were arrested. The regime said that we are sending a special judicial committee to Mashhad to deal with the cases of those arrested there. And, and this Raisi and Nayari were the two members of this judicial committee that went to Mashhad to deal with the 1994 detainees of the uprising in Mashhad. And uh, I want to say that the criminal activities of Ibrahim Raisi, one case of it was the 1988 massacre, which is the largest and most significant one. But Raisi, wherever he has gone, whatever he has done is uh, the su repression, suppression and execution. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Farsi, for those uh, uh, very uh, strong uh, remarks. So before uh, uh, proceeding to our last uh, two witnesses, I would like to let you know that uh, an in-depth report about Raisi and uh, his ascent to this post and also his past is going to be published on the NCRI website today. This is a very uh, uh, shocking report. I will show you the, the front uh, page of this report which is about the mass murderer, Ibrahim Raisi. And this uh, is available today after this press conference on the NCRI website, which is ncr-iran.org. So with that, uh, now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, our next uh, eyewitness, Mr. Nasrullah Marandi, uh, who was wounded and arrested uh, by in an IRGC attack in Tehran in 1981. He was then transferred to Ebin uh, prison and tortured while wounded. He was imprisoned in Ebin, Ezel Hesar, and Guhardash prisons for 10 years. So Mr. Marandi, please go ahead and make your remarks. With greetings to everyone in this panel. My name is Nasrullah Marandi. In 1981 to 1991, I was in three prisons in Evin, in Ghazal Hassar and Gohardash. I would like to bear witness today about Ibrahim Raisi, who is the candidate for the presidency of the Iranian regime. In uh, the summer of 1988, the IRGC came to the uh, wards in Gohardash prison and took many of my friends and myself to solitary confinement cells. On the morning of uh, 15 Mordad, uh, which I, uh, uh, the, 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 the RGC guard took me to the death row. And there are many, many uh, cells in that death corridor uh, where we wait to go into the death commission. Um, and most of the people over there were sympathizers of the Mujahideen, the MEK. When I too was taken to the death corridor, <clears throat> both sides of the corridor was full of uh, prisoners waiting their turn to go to the death commission. In the two, three minute uh, uh, hearings in the death commission, uh, 
they took me to the death commission and it was a panel there of uh, Nayeri, Ishraqi, Pur Muhammadi, Shushtari and Raisi. Uh, I had seen Raisi before in the newspapers and I knew him and uh, he played a very key role as uh, the deputy prosecutor of Tehran. On the first uh, step, he told us that I will execute all of you. And he did have a very active role in the execution of, uh, of the MEK prisoners. Someone had to sign the death sentences after the sentence. And uh, they took me back to the death corridor. And on the 15th of Mordad, the Iranian month of Mordad, which is one of the bloodiest days, many of my friends were executed, some of whom He's mentioning Muhammad Noor Pabar and many others who were executed by Raisi and other members of the death commission. Notably, whenever the death sentences of uh, 10 to 12 prisoners were issued, uh, the members of the execution squad, along with one of these judges, one of these death commission members would move the groove to the end of the death corridor, which was a very large hall. And they would be hanged by ropes in that hall. And uh, after in 1988 uh, massacre, even those who had uh, depression or physical uh, ailments or they were ill or women who were Ill, they, all of them were executed with no distinction. <clears throat> in uh, the fall of 1908, only one small ward in Gohardash prison called Ward Sis 13 made up all the political prisoners who had survived the massacre. It's noteworthy that as a plaintiff and witness in the trial of another criminal named Hamid Nouri, who was an accomplice of Raisi, Will, and will soon be tried in Sweden by the Swedish prosecutor. I have been invited by the Swedish prosecutor and I have testified there against Raisi in a preliminary hearing last year. Raisi is the regime's main candidate in the sham election in Iran. He's a criminal involved in the 1988 massacre of prisoners and in the years before and after that. The United Nations and the United States and Europe must condemn his candidacy and announce that this sham election cannot be legitimate or recognized. <clears throat> Raisi should not be able to travel to other countries because, his in, because of his involvement in genocide of the MEK. He must be tried on genocide charges and he shouldn't be in a position of a president or the head of the government. Thank you very much for the time that you gave me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marandi. Uh, I should also mention that uh, Mr. Nasrullah Marandi has lost five family members who were, all of them are accused of supporting the uh, Mujahideen al organization. Our uh, next uh, eyewitness uh, who is going to make uh, his testimony is Mr. Mahmoud Royai. Mr. Royai was in, uh, Evin Qazel Hisar and Guhardash prisons for 10 years. He has published his pres uh, prison memoirs in five volume called Aftab Quran. Mr. Royai, please go ahead. Uh, greetings to all of you at this conference. I would like to pay tribute to thousands of political prisoners who were executed with the signature and the verdict that was signed by Raisi, Ibrahim Raisi. For the first time, I met Ibrahim Raisi on Wednesday, August 3rd in 1988 at the death commission of Gohadash prison. Of course, I did not know them, know him from before. And at that time, at that day, I did not know his name was Raisi, but I learned that one of the persons who was very active uh, that, uh, that no political prisoner should stay alive is this person. This, this person, Ibrahim Raisi and poor Muhammad. They're, 
their utmost effort was to execute everyone. So maybe friends may not be aware that Ibrahim Raisi was in 1984, uh, Ali, Rani, Ali Razini's deputy. And uh, he followed in exactly the same path as the butcher of Evin, Asadullah Lajewardi, who executed a large number of political prisoners in 1984 and 1985. And this race, it really uh, followed Lajewardi's uh, uh, directives and uh, made the same uh, savage killings and brutal killings and executions in the prisons, just like Lajewardi. Uh, when, when there was no fatwa on the, about the massacres, which was issued in 1988, uh, Raisi was doing the same thing in the prisons before that on a, another scale. Uh, another important point is that Ibrahim Raisi, when he was 20 years old, became the prosecutor of Karaj, inflicted horrendous calamity on the prisoners in Karaj and also, also in Hamadan. But we don't have enough time. And Mrs. Gudarzi discussed this about what he did to prisoners in Hamadan. He was uh, maybe one of the first persons who gave a verdict to throw someone off a mountainside, off a cliff. In Karaj prison, he didn't have mercy on anyone. When he was a prosecutor, he would just say, execute them. I am saying this introduction so that we can reach 1988 when he was a member of the Death Commission. When he was, uh, the, he knew everyone, every prisoner in Gohardash prison. And because he was from the prosecutor of Karaj and Gohardash was in Karaj and he did not have mercy on a single prisoner. I just want to give you one example, one example of Kave Nasari. Kave Nasari, was uh, who, who had finished his sentence and was supposed to be freed. And they, they kept him, they still kept him. And he had severe epilepsy. And because of the severe tortures that he had endured during his prison term, and uh, he, 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 during his episodes of epilepsy, he would injure himself. And, and everyone knew uh, that uh, and they had promised that they would free him, but they never did. Raisi brought Kave uh, to the death corridor, and uh, Kave had an epilepsy episode, and his face was injured. And Raisi came and gave him a death sentence and signed it right there to a person who had who had who had uh, really was not remembering who he was even and he was injured from an epileptic episode and uh, this is a ho horrible and we know that if Ibrahim Raisi was not in the death commission uh, uh, they would not have executed this Kave uh, but but Raisi executed him uh, because he had a grudge against all the prisoners and did not want one of them to survive and he had no mercy, no mercy on the ill, no, no mercy on those who were in the infirmary. Many of the prisoners had many hard illnesses. Mohsen, Mohsen was uh, uh, from birth paralyzed and, uh, and he was a prisoner and, uh, and Asullah must have seen him, uh, Nasrullah must have seen him. Uh, they took him and they executed him. And, uh, and Nasser Mansuri, which they took him, they, they brought him with a stretcher. And, and you would not think that they would execute someone who is on a stretcher, but they took him with a, with a stretcher and hanged him and executed him. So Raisi did not have mercy on any prisoner. And uh, many of the people who Raisi uh, issued a verdict for uh, their execution were pupils in school during their, during their arrest. At the time of the arrest, they were underage. They were pupils and they took them from schools 
and, and they were in prison for six, seven years, served sentences, were tortured. And then these people, these same people, these same prisoners were uh, issued verdicts of, of execution, such as Sohail Danani, Masoud Eftekhari, Hamid Muayyari, Hamid Khazri. Ahmad Ghulami was only 13 years old when he was arrested, underage. But, but this, this, this criminal mullah, Ibrahim Raisi, signed his verdict for death sentence to be executed. In my opinion, Ibrahim Raisi is the product of this regime, the product of, he, he was the sword of that massacre on the top of, on the head of every prisoner at that day. And just as Nasrullah, my colleague said, uh, from my, in my opinion, Ibrahim Raisi's place is not, uh, is, is, on, is, on a, is on a trial chair to be tried in, and uh, um, everyone who has heard me, everyone who hears me, uh, as far as it is possible, it, it is a human duty on your part, on everyone's part, anyone who hears this, anyone who be, comes to know about this, that a perpetrator of such genocide, of such mass murder, of such crimes against humanity, should not sit on the chair of a presidency and he should be brought to justice, brought to trial. And uh, uh, accepting such a person, uh, compromising with him, uh, sitting next to him is an insult to humanity, insult to human beings. And uh, we should not uh, live by this. And he, he should be tried and he should be brought to justice. And I ask all journalists, all friends, anyone who hears this to please assist in this. Thank you very much for your time. And I appreciate that I have been granted the opportunity to speak about this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Royai. I think that that was a very powerful uh, speech and remarks you made. And uh, there are many reporters and uh, representatives of different media present in this press conference who heard your testimony. And uh, I'm sure everybody, everybody is convinced that this criminal uh, should be brought to justice soon. So before uh, making uh, just a few uh, final, ports, uh, final uh, points, uh, my apologies, there was a technical problem and Ms. Gudarzi uh, did not uh, finish her speech. So I would like to ask Ms. Farida Gudarzi to please uh, continue uh, making the points that you weren't, uh, you weren't able to finish. I thank you very much, Mr. Abedini, to, to have given me a time again as our guest and uh, my brothers spoke about what has happened and what they had seen about uh, Raisi and his crimes. What I want to add is that Raisi is a person who for 41 years has a black record of murder, execution, torture and prison imprisonment of the most uh, uh, bravest of Iran's sons and daughters and uh, sympathizers of the Mujahideen. He had, he, he, he had no mercy. He wanted to execute every single person who were affiliated to the Mujahideen or MEK. And for 41 years, he committed these crimes until he is here today as a presidential candidate of this criminal regime. In Hamadan prison, uh, Raisi was a prosecutor and he carried out the verdicts that he himself issued. And uh, the interrogation cells in the basement of Hamadan prison were torture cells and prisoners would be tortured there. And Raisi was himself present on top of all these tortures, witnessing them and directing them. And he carried out the verdicts when the executions were carried out, he was there himself on um, uh, uh, 20th of May and uh, 1984, 510 of uh, the Mujahideen, uh, whose names she's mentioning. 
were uh, were executed, were, were hanged by a crane in the courtyard of Hamadan prison. And Raisi was there to witness the execution personally. And when they gave uh, the uh, the bodies of these prisoners to their families, uh, the families said all their teeth had been uh, had been crushed because of the cable of the crane which had pulled them up. Now, I want to emphasize that all the prisoners that from 1981 to 1985 were executed in Hamadan province and all of its townships, Raisi was a directly responsible for all of them. And I knew some of them, such as Fakhri Qolami, Mahnaz Sahrakar, who was a 16 year old girl uh, because uh, who was raped by IRGC guards before she was executed, and uh, Ali Atoyi and and Ali Gudarzi, who was uh, shot in the eyes by uh, the guards, and his hands were paralyzed, and they still had tortured him, and Raisi issued his execution verdict, and they hanged him and many other martyrs such as Ahad, Araisi, and Behzad, Afsali, Karim Saleh, and all of them, all of them were executed by direct uh, involvement of Ibrahim Raisi. And I would like to say that from 1982 uh, uh, in Hamadan prison, uh, prisoners were only hanged. They were not uh, shot by firing squad, they were hanged because Raisi said they will uh, suffer more by hanging. In uh, Hamadan, they intimidated, in order to intimidate the prisoners, and they would, they would throw the prisoners from the cliffs of Asadabad mountain, which is in Hamadan. And, uh, or in public view, they would cut off the heads of uh, some prisoners. And I was a witness because my own brother was martyred in uh, 1990. Uh, uh, he was uh, he was arrested. He was shot, and his right hand and right foot, were, right leg were shot. They took him to uh, operation, and then the next day they took him to a torture cell for interrogation. And he was given 100 uh, whips. And uh, he was uh, he was uh, um, uh, uh, excuse me exec uh, um, in prison in 1979 and executed in 1988 as a victim of the 1988 massacres. So as a witness to the 1988 massacres and a family member of those who were martyred, I want to emphasize that we will not forgive and that we will not forget. And that until the day that we bring Raisi to trial and to justice, we shall not forgive and we shall not forget. Thank you very much for giving me time and listening to my comments. I ask all the journalists to please echo these testimonies, echo the suffering of the Iranian people against this uh, criminal, Ibrahim Raisi. And uh, this is... Uh, this is something that continues in my land, in my homeland. Thank you very much. I thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gudarzi. It's, uh, and thank you all our uh, witnesses today who made uh, very, very horrific and shocking uh, remarks about their own experiences, which uh, of course they, they, they were speaking just the portion of the crimes uh, committed by Ibrahim Raisi and this barbarous regime. So with this, uh, I think the message has been very clear. Uh, appeasing this regime has never been a solution. And I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, feasible any longer uh, because this will uh, only facilitate repression and mass murders inside Iran and further destruction, chaos, terrorism, and uh, oppression outside of Iran. So I want to uh, thank all our, uh, all the uh, audience, uh, the, the reporters uh, and the representatives of different media 
uh, and also our uh, eyewitnesses who made very, very shocking testimonies. And if anybody needs uh, the report uh, that uh, I mentioned and I showed to you, please refer to go to the website of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, which is ncri-iran.org. And we will also send you a, uh, the report of this press conference for those who attended the conference and they need it. So I once again, thank you very much. And I wish all of you all the best. Thank you.